my last day in quarantining in Mexico before um, film going up to America tomorrow because you can't obviously get into America so you have to spend two weeks in Mexico. Um, worst places to be. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, so you can go into America if, if provided you go from like not one of the places that they, you know, the UK or there are a few America, other banned countries, isn't it? American border control is, is passport agnostic, i.e. they don't care what color your passport is. What they care is where you spent the last two weeks. That's interesting. Um, so, yeah, Mexico is a great place. I'm actually going there in mid mid February. Are you? Yeah, just to. Uh, what are you doing there? I, I'm just gonna go and, uh, and and work from a different place, basically. That's not locked down. I mean, I, I don't know whether that's right or wrong, but uh, that's that's what we've resolved to do. I think that's it makes a lot of sense. You're going to Mexico City. Uh, yeah, for the first time, I've been to like Mazunte, Oaxaca uh, uh, for six weeks um, right. in 2019. But this time, we're going to go for a couple of months and just sort of hopefully till lockdown's over. Where, whereabouts are you in Mexico at the moment? Mexico City? I'm in Cabo, uh, which is All on right. the Pacific. A lot of people from LA here. Yeah, yeah. And it's just life's normal here. You can have 100 people in a restaurant. And uh, life's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it seems out of what is it? I think there are 196 countries in the world. How many do, is is it? Is it most of them a, a lockdown, or is it actually? I guess the UK, from what I can see, is one of the most affected. Um, there are parts of the world where I've been working because we've tried to work fairly full on since July. Um, East Africa is okay. Um, the Caribbean's okay, um, uh, and Europe's shit. Um, Middle East, if you want to go there, is okay. I don't really want to go to the Middle East when it's good. Never mind when it's bad. Um, <laughs> so I think you're making a very sound decision. Oh, all my I'm team, glad to hear it. All my team are, are, are going through Mexico. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just so we can. I, I get a bit guilt, not guilty, but like wary of, I don't know, people have such strong and differing opinions on coronavirus that like sometimes I feel like if I said to some people, oh, I'm going to Mexico uh, to try and avoid this uh, mundane existence of living under house arrest, uh, I, I think some people would probably get pretty pissed off really, but I, I don't know, I don't really care. I think we've got to watch out that we don't, the wokes, of this world and what Piers Morgan calls the illiberal liberal liberals. They don't just crush our lives completely. We've got to make our own decisions. And if you're not breaking the law, you're not breaking the law by coming to Mexico. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That, I mean, that's the logic you, I would use. And you can justify it saying you are, your product is global um, and you need to understand a little bit more about Mexican culture or Latin American culture. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. You can bluff it. And you're obviously a smart kid. I'm looking forward to discussing some of your favorite music with you. This is the greatest music of all time podcast, of course. Um, I want to start by asking you, how big a role does music play in your life? <laughs> um, I think I, I grew up in the 80s. Um, well, I hope I've never, I hope I haven't grown up yet, but I was, the age when you're meant to grow up, um, like at university and uh, uh, just pre-university was a golden era for 80s rock bands. And uh, it's funny in Mexico where I am now, they've got a channel and all they play is 80s music. And, and Britain dominated the music industry in the 80s. For every song that was not a British rock song, there were 10 British rock songs. Uh, maybe maybe not quite one to ten, maybe two to ten, because men at work in excess, they get the old entry. But by and large, it was dominated by British rock bands. Um, I travel a lot, and um, in uh, I, I, in America, next week, for instance, I think we'll be on the road for about fifty hours, and um, music gets us by on road trips. I think there's something about road trips that uh, 
in America, it's the best place in the world for a road trip. And, and, and uh, the um, extension of the highway system in America was integral to the American dream. Um, and we spend a lot of time on that highway system. Uh, and uh, country music or is, an, is a big part of what we do. So we, we can't get by without listening to country music on the road. Having done a couple of uh, road trips myself, I've uh, been to all 48 contiguous states or, um, on the last road trip that I did uh, in, in a couple of months. And, uh, and yeah, I, I can't think of a better place for a road trip than it. Such nostalgia. So what, you, you're going to be on the road for 50 days when you go there. Um, no, we'll, be, we'll be well, 50 hours in, in a week. Oh, 50 hours, we're, sorry, we're, yeah. We're um, continuing a, a Wild West theme where we, it's my interpretation of the greatest story ever told, which was the move west in the 19th century. And uh, we're trying to incorporate uh, a bit of modernity, but equally a sensitivity to the culture of this 1870s and 1880s to the to the costume uh and we've found some extraordinary places to shift and uh, so it starts next week to me there's the thing about the wild west and westerns which i think tarantino embraced uh in um in django where uh, and, and also of course in the hateful eight where the um cold weather is actually integral to the whole Western genre and, and, and uh, vistas and visuals. So we like to photograph um, the John Ford scenery with snow on the ground, if at all possible. It just adds another visual layer. Wow. Yeah, that's, I'm sure that will look incredible. Um, I'm sure you'll shoot, shoot it um, in, in a very interesting way. You, you've mentioned here, you know, that there are three artists that you wanted to, to discuss. Um, and relating to, to country, of course, is Willie Nelson. You know, would you say, is Willie Nelson one of your favorite artists? Yes, and uh, we are hopefully working, going to be working with Willie later on this year in Luck in uh, outside Austin in Texas. Wow. Uh, he, uh, his road to success had so many knocks along the way. It was 90% about failure before he finally made it. And I think that is a prompt to us all. So his journey, uh, which largely in his 20s and early 30s was characterized by, by failure and by pushbacks and going back and selling vacuum cleaners or encyclopedias. Um, I think it's a lesson to us all that, that failure is, is a bruise, it isn't a tattoo and you learn from your failure. Um, success is 99% failure. Uh, I am a huge admiration for him. Um, I love the fact that he, he doesn't like to be categorized. He, he would go from listening to R&B to jazz to listening to Rachmaninoff and Bach. And uh, it slightly resonates with me because sometimes people in my much more modest way want to say that I'm a wildlife photographer. I'm not a wildlife photographer, I'm just a photographer. And I think the best musicians um, don't like to be categorized. It is not really about a guitar or drums. It, it, it is about your passion for music and, and rhythm and, uh, and lyrics. And he was a songwriter first and foremost. That's where he made his first money was in writing songs. And um, yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, he is someone that's very close to all our heart. We have a, a rule in the car that every morning when we start, whether ever it's four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, we start with um, a Willie Nelson song. And the one that more often than not, we start with because we all are good high energy people is in the city of New Orleans. Um, and uh, it's to us, it's our, emblematic song of our business and, and our road trips. So we'll be playing that uh, a lot next week. Yeah, I can imagine. Is there a definitive 
place that you would suggest kind of is is there like a good documentary on Willie Nelson is there a good is there a good, has he done an autobiography I mean I know and I listen to Willie Nelson and I, I, I love his music but I kind of want to go on a bit more of a deep appreciation uh, for his journey because it sounds pretty interesting you know there's been a lot of books written his, his own biography which I've read um, um, I think it's just called uh, my life um, uh, is is uh, is it's fascinating um, and because uh, he meets there's so many stories there that uh, uh, I didn't know about. Um, you know, he should have been on that plane with uh, was it Billy Holly and um, and uh, didn't make it at the last minute and would, would have died. Um, the um, had so many issues with 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 the tax man as well. And he really took on the music industry, challenged the music industry. And I, I go to Nashville quite a bit. Um, I'm fascinated by Nashville. And if you're if you work in film and and and, and the visual arts, LA is the toughest place in the world, which is why you need to go there. Because if you're average, you get found out. In the very same way, um, if you're um, if your music, particularly, I guess country music, but, but Kings of Leon as well, if, uh, based in Nashville. Uh, I think Nashville is where you get found out or not. I think it must be an incredibly tough city to make it. And that's where he made it in the end. Um, I think the best way to learn about Willie Nelson, for those that are interested, is to watch the movie Honey, Honeysuckle Rose, where he plays himself in the movie. Um, and uh, it's a, it's, um, it's a kind of Star is Born, same genre as the first Star is Born movie. Um, and just as, just as fun. Uh, I've got to know a bit of his band, um, one or two of his band members, and they're charming. Um, they're, they're all there to help you um, if you've got something to offer. And I hope we have something to offer and we can work with them in philanthropy and and, and create something that's authentic. Authenticity is so important. And is, is Honeysuckle Rose, like, is it based on, on Willie Nelson in terms of the story? You've got to work on the basis that it is. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, he would be the first to admit he maybe misbehaved a little bit on tour, uh, that, uh, and on tour in a rock band, lots of things that, that go on. He was always dead against um, narcotics. I mean, you could you could have weed all you wanted, but in terms of other stuff on tour, he was dead against it. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page. Yeah, Honeysuckle, it's a, it's a good movie. And, and it, he plays himself. Does he still tour a lot, Willie Nelson? Like, it, it, obviously, COVID, you know, taking COVID out of the equation. From what I know, he's quite a road. He loves the road. Yeah, it's an integral part of what he does. I know his wife, uh, Annie, I think, has wrapped him up um, in cotton wool. So he's at his age, uh, he's a risk. So um, uh, there can be no contact there at the moment. And uh, But he does put on these shows in his own little village that he built for one of his films called Luck. And that's where we'll be filming um, if we do get the chance. Wow. Yeah, an uh, incredible artist, um, Willie Nelson. But I feel like it, I've only really scratched the surface. What what actually got you into him in the first place? Was there an album? Was there was there a song? What what kind of was was the touchstone? I, I think spending an awful lot of time in three states in America, um, uh, Texas, where he's from. Uh, we spend a lot of time in West Texas, uh, as well as and it's real cowboy country. And then the other state that considers itself a rival to 
Texas as a cowboy state, which is Montana. So we do, and then to an extent Wyoming as well. So if you consider the three biggest kind of cowboy states in America, and you've traveled the, the country well, um, all three of those country music uh, is uh, integral to the whole way of life there. And I think his daughter is one of the DJs on Outlaw Radio and uh, all they play on Outlaw Radio is just ridiculous. They're ridiculous country songs that mostly involve people that have been in prison and take way too many drugs. <laughs> Uh, and uh, w when you go to America this time, will, will you be going to different states in the 50 days? Oh, yeah, we're there for quite a while. So we'll be in Cowtown states like Kansas, um, Colorado, uh, mining, which is, uh, they, they, they left so many trails from uh, the gold rush and the copper rush in the 1850s, 1860s. Um, and it's high Colorado, so you get these old ghost towns that have been left virtually untainted. Um, and then um, Utah, the kind of John Ford territory around there, uh, which is stunning. Um, and then uh, you, um, uh, Wyoming uh, and, and Montana. Uh, wow. And New Mexico as well. And are these states open or does it vary? Uh, COVID didn't happen in Texas, but then again, neither did the uh, election. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, the, every state is different, but COVID is a less of an issue in states like Texas. It's clearly a very big issue in California in terms of restrictions and the ways of doing business. It's a big issue in Washington state. Um, the thing about some of these uh, states like Utah, um, like Montana, like Wyoming, the population density is very thin. You're yeah. not, it's not like you think you're, you're working within the M25. Um, so I think there's only two and a half million people that live in Montana and it's the size of the UK. So there is, uh, there's room to do an awful lot there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a very interesting place to go and beautiful scenery in, in places like, uh, or very yeah. interesting scenery in places like that, um, yeah. places like Wyoming. Are you a fan of, of California as a state? Is that, is that a state that you, that you enjoy spending time in? There are a lot of people that have found out during COVID that if the lights are turned off and the restaurants aren't there and the glitz isn't there and the glamour and the stars and um, that California loses a little bit of its edge. It's also a place with very high taxes and um, um, fairly illiberal in lots of ways. So it was always perceived to be liberal. Uh, uh, and you've seen an exodus out of California, which places like Texas are benefiting from. I think one of your peers in podcast, Joe Rogan, has moved and very publicly moved from California yeah. to Texas. Elon Musk has very publicly moved from California to Texas. Um, California is the center of excellence and clusters in, in technology and in film and entertainment where you can learn an awful lot. Um, I spend a lot of time in Los Angeles and I love LA, but I didn't like LA in 2020. I couldn't wait to get rid out of LA in 2020 because everything's closed down and I would just go to the studio, come back to my uh, kind of Airbnb, get a takeaway, go to bed, go back into the studio. That would be my routine. It was fairly dull. Yeah. Um, and do you sympathize therefore with people like Joe Rogan moving out? I mean, I, I'm a fan of his podcast. I think his podcast is great um, personally. Um, do, you, do you sympathize with people like that? There'd be more there's been a, an exodus um, absolutely. you're absolutely right if you can afford if you can afford not financially but in terms of the the your your career being strong enough that you don't need to be in LA a lot of people are in LA because they need to because they they they're, they haven't got to the position in their career where they can avoid not being in the epicenter at all with the agents and the chitter chatter and the prospecting. If you've made it, 
where people come to you, then you can go wherever you want. I think, yeah. Well, if you look at these famous actresses, and there's quite a few of the sort of top 10 most famous actresses in the world are in Nashville right now. So um, I, I, simp- I, I like California is vast. So when people say, do you like California? Well, what do they mean? There's a huge difference between the culture of San Francisco and San Diego to Los Angeles. To yeah. San- it's, it's, it's vast. So we must remember that. Yeah. When people talk about California, they can they sometimes maybe have a vision of just uh, LA, the Beach Boys, or I don't think they think about so much about um, um, Palo Alto and Silicon Valley and stuff. I think they think more about the Beach Boys and and uh, Beverly Hills nine two oh one five and and Baywatch and Beverly Hills Cop and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it is a small part of the whole thing. West Hollywood, which is where I would spend a lot of my time in a normal year, is not where I want to spend my time right now. Yeah. Do you see the situation improving in, in, oh, in Los Angeles? Of course, it's going to improve everywhere. Yeah. It's got to, otherwise you'd get, no, of course it's going to improve. We just don't know when, but uh, you've got to be an optimist. Yeah, for sure. But is there, is there something in the way that the, a place like Los Angeles has handled coronavirus kind of also mirroring their stance on, on various issues. You know, you mentioned high taxation. Will this have been a wake up call or a, or a sort of realization for some people that actually, you know what, like the way that LA is being run, it's not just COVID. This COVID has exposed something deeper um, and perhaps other states have, because LA is very, very expensive, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think you've answered your own question. There has been an exodus out of LA. If you look at property prices in places like Aspen, Colorado, they're up 30% this year. Property prices are up 30% in Aspen. Why is that? It's people moving from Colorado, from, from California. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing about America is there, there is such great geographical mobility uh, because People can move from one place to the other and they have culture, they have education, they have hospitals, it's everything that you need. Whereas in the UK, you don't have that breadth of choice. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's completely different um, countries and uh, both both with their merits. And, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of write off L- LA uh, in, front of, in front of my listeners, but I... Yeah, it seems like it must have been a miserable, miserable year over there and uh, a lot of frustrations. Um, on a more uplifting note, I wanted to kind of move on to your next uh, musical uh, act that, that you um, wanted to discuss, and that was The Cure. Um, wh- why would they be up there for you? You know, when you get asked, uh, what's your favourite film? Um, the answer probably is going to be the film that you've watched the most number of times. There'll be some people that will say, no, 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 because I just watch Love Actually the whole time because I watch it every Christmas. It's not my favorite film. Um, and I kind of get that. Or I watch The Great Escape every Boxing Day because that's what we tend to do. But by and large, the films that you watch the most are your favorite films. They tend to be quite populous as well. So if you look back over the last 20 years, the, the the gladiators of this world. I think that's why everyone was so excited of Top Gun release coming out because for my generation, everyone watched the first Top Gun because it was a great movie. I think it's the same in music. The, the, the albums that you've listened to the most um, are the ones you like the most. It'd be rather counting too if that wasn't the case. Uh, I've got a, a, a jukebox at home in Devon and it's one of these ones where you can put the CDs in yourself. So you've got a choice of 100 CDs. And I've got a kind of American saloon bar. And people can choose whatever album they want to put on. And we go from way back to Johnny Cash all the way through to the current day. And the album that's played most, and this includes old people like me and my 20-year-old daughter and her university mates is the Cure's Greatest Hits. 
So, and why? Because there's not a bad track on it. Um, and um, there are some monster songs in there. That, and what I love is that 18 year olds love those songs as well, rather than the latest thing that's just happened to be on Britain's Got Talent or The X Factor. The Cure is up there. And my, um, they played in Glasgow's Bella Houston Park, my home city, last year. And that's what my daughter wanted as her, as her present was to, uh, to go to The Cure. And there, it was brilliant. So it's really just that straightforward. I, I'm trying to think of the album that I would play next most to The Cure um, on that jukebox. Um, uh, and it might be, it might be a Rolling Stones, might be Beatles, um, it might be In Excess, might be U2, might be Simple Minds, um, might be Billy Joel, might be Elson John, but whatever those ones are, the one that's played the most is The Cure. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, The Cure do have some massive songs. Do they, do they play their hits when they play live? You know, all of their hits, like even, you know, Friday, I'm yep. in love and that type of stuff. Yeah, they start off quite slowly, but it, it builds quite quickly into uh, um, something. Uh, the, they start off with the ones as always that perhaps we don't know so well. And is, is, is that, is that um, setup that you've got with vinyl or are those CDs? Uh, yeah, CDs. CDs. And, and the other artist you've mentioned here is Robbie Williams. So, you know, is, is this, is, is he one of your favorite artists? I, um, I've run into Robbie a bit in LA um, and there's no one that I know that is more different from his outward persona of that constant entertainer than uh, Robbie Williams, he, he is a constant entertainer. Um, as we we know so well from some of his appearances on stage, where whenever he's been on stage, he's owned the whole bloody place. Um, but he's so much more than that. He's he's a polymath. He's a he's a big thinker, and he's an artist. Uh, he's um. He, I say this, I say this uh, as someone that I can relate to. I think he's got uh, an addictive personality. And what does that mean? That doesn't mean going down the line of or drinks or all that drugs or all that. No, no, no. Addictive personality can be someone that is addicted to learning or addicted to working. And I think he's a very hardworking guy. He's addicted to self-improvement uh, and and his biggest fear i think would be to be ill-informed on something uh so i have a huge amount of respect for someone that can be that consummate entertainer on the surface but beneath that facade has an insecurity as i do about not quite being good enough on many different levels and um, I think when he gets on stage uh, and he's on form, he's the best that there is. Uh, and uh, I really admire the fact that he um, remains full of self-doubt to the extent the way that that manifests itself is just constant self-improvement. Uh, and he's a very different person to the person that we maybe remember sort of 15 years ago. Yeah, so you, you think he's improved in terms of his the, the personal side of, uh, of things, his personal life, he's, he's evolved I can't as a human being. I can't, I, can't make, I, I can't make a comment on that, I never knew him, I don't, and I don't really yeah. know him, or, uh, but he is not the, the, he's a family man, he's a yeah. big family man, and, and uh, uh, I think that he had demons probably when he was on tour the whole time. Uh, but he is uh, someone that I think is so conscious of 
firstly, the fact that we only live here once and I'm going to make the most in terms of learning uh, in so much detail. When I went to see him about my work, the detail that he knew my work was, was quite, quite extraordinary, humbling. And um, I have huge admiration for the fact that I don't, the, 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 his capacity to learn. Uh, it's one thing to be one of the great entertainers in the world, to, to have um, sung a song that's probably one of the most serenaded songs or karaoke songs in the last 20 years in Angel and, and so many other great pieces of work. Um, but underneath that person, he would be someone that I would could spend in, a, in that mountain cabin for four days and talk because there'd be no shortage of intelligence coming from his mouth. And people don't know that, don't get that about him. Yeah, I feel like he's, I think people like Robbie Williams probably come in and out of, of fashion in the sense of, you know, he's been a, a, one of the most famous British entertainers for a long, long time. And I guess people like that have, you know, they have peaks and, and they, and, they have, you know, lower moments, but I mean, he's still obviously very, very commercially successful. But I feel like he sometimes gets gets a hard gets a hard time um, on social media and, and things like that. Um, and when and and sometimes I feel oh. like he's undervalued by some people because he is one of the great British entertainers, particularly of the last 20, 20 years, thirty years. He's he's much loved, and one of the reasons I think he's much loved is he has so much love to give. He, 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 a room is better with him in it by a mile. He's uh, he's magnetic. Yeah, for sure. And some of the best, yeah. some of the best records made of, of the '90s that still sound, you know, still sound incredible today. People still love them today. They're timeless. I bet you, if you if you gave him a, a, a an examination on the history of music. Um, over the last 200 years, and you put him up against uh, the artists that are currently in the top 50 positions in the charts, in Spotify or whatever, I reckon he'd come on the top three. Yeah, I can definitely imagine that. Do you listen to much modern music, and are you a fan of, of what's in the charts at the moment? Um, I don't really know what's in the charts, but I'd see the Wham's Last Christmas is in the charts, and I enjoyed Wham's Last Christmas. Um, I, um, I, I don't listen to it enough. Um, I'm not in the UK enough to put on Capital Radio or Radio One, or I'm not in Ibiza enough to listen to what's being played in Ibiza. Um, uh, and I don't, so I don't know dance music as well, and I don't, um, and no rap music well. Uh, there's some people that are big in rap that uh, as a possibility of um, um, uh, doing a shoot with the rap artist in Megan the Stallion, and apparently she's mm -hmm. hugely famous. She, really famous, yeah. Uh, I had to be informed by my daughter as to exactly what she was. So I'm, I'm slightly, <laughs> I'm slightly out of the out of the scene in that, um, but. Um, yeah, sure, my age. What for, what is the the thing throughout your your career that you're most proud of, and what do you think is the most valuable piece of advice that you've learned from your career um, that you would pass on to others? I think uh, in terms of the things I'm most proud of, it's a tricky one. That um, I'm proud of the jobs that we've created. Um, I'm proud of the money we've raised for philanthropy and conservation, particularly in a year like last year where the recipients were never in greater need of help. Uh, and whether it be in Australia with our wildfire campaign or with the NHS or um, some of the other campaigns we did, um, I think, you know, we raised over $3 million last year for those uh, campaigns. And, and I think that means that we've raised about 15 million over the last five or six years. Um, so doing well by doing good, I think is an important message. 
collaborating with like-minded people is important. Uh, in terms of, um, and I think last year it was very tough for, for so many people. The art market might not have been so tough as other areas because even though the people couldn't necessarily physically see the art, the art market was ticking over in a way that live music wasn't ticking over or live restaurants weren't ticking over. Uh, so I think we, we, we sold $20 million of photographs last year. And I think that's not a bad achievement in a, in a COVID year. Um, in, in terms of um, the things I'd pass on in terms of what I've learned, um, I think uh, I touched upon this with Willie Nelson. I think it's important that you embrace failure and don't get derailed by failure. Failure is uh, an integral part of success. It's success is 99% failure. Just learn from what you're not quite getting right and be determined. I think aligned to that is to be your own biggest critic. Um, and I think the people that allow others to be their biggest critic are making a bit of an error in that. Um, be so tough on yourself that no one can be tougher than you. Uh, and uh, I've always had heroes. Um, and when people come in for jobs, interviews or internships with us, and one of my sort of throwaway questions is, who's your hero? Uh, and then they don't have an answer. I don't mind if that answer is Harry Kane. I don't mind if that answer is Lionel Messi or Ronaldo or what it doesn't, doesn't or Roger Federer, but, it, but at least have one. Um, and I, um, my hero, I've got a few heroes, but Steven Spielberg would be a hero of mine, um, Martin Scorsese. Ridley Scott, but Steven Spielberg is, is my hero. And I'm encyclopedic about everything about him. When he was Jaws, when he was young, but your age, maybe only marginally older than you when he was doing making Jaws. Uh, and the lessons that he learned and um, his attention to detail, his um, his understanding of the, the need to elicit emotion in the viewer, um, I think that's important. Uh, and I, I've, I've, I've learned an, an awful lot from people like that. Um, uh, photography without emotion is nothing. Music without emotion, you could probably argue, is nothing. Uh, and we live in a very content spoiled uh, world. Steven Spielberg had a great fear of the mundane. His biggest fear was to bore people. Obviously, he hasn't bored people. But you can see that in his work because it's 180 degrees the other way. So I think if you're in the creative world, a starting position of being slightly concerned about the mundane of what is mundane is a good starting point. If you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, we would really appreciate it if you were able to leave us a rating and a review. We really welcome suggestions for future guests. So when you're leaving your review, please feel free to leave the name of anyone you would love to see featured on the Greatest Music of All Time podcast.